sneak in similarly to these like innocent bunnies in her garden and they offer us this immediate comfort, right? But if we go to rely on these worldly comforts or we come to welcome them in and like don't make any kind of um, effort to, uh, to manage them basically, they will eventually steal our joy. So she talks about how our goal is to subdue these passions so we can experience something called apathia uh, not to be confused with apathy, which the book describes as an abiding sense of peace and joy, subdued and subdued and balance is maintained, or passions are subdued and balance is maintained. So one of the examples she uses, she uses two really good examples. The first one is habitual cursing, right? She says, studies show that people who curse habitually are happier and healthier and smarter than those who don't. But the reality is that cursing is just like a really quick, temporary release of like anger um, and so she says people who curse all the time <laughs> don't control their anger right and so this anger um you know is kind of like left to its own devices in our lives and it masquerades itself as this temporary relief but in reality it's a thief of joy right like a lot of anger removes us from god and in turn takes away our joy um, and she says the same thing of like, if, you know, maybe you don't curse, but you yell a lot. She's like, it's the same thing. And she goes on to say like, you know, this example may be a little more universal. She's like, all of us have succumbed to comfort food at one time or another, either out of like boredom or anxiety or whatever. But when you turn this like worldly passion or continually turn to this worldly passion to ease your life, it can like lead to health problems and maybe you start binge eating and you really come to rely on it and that becomes gluttony. And gluttony like anger is a thief of joy, right? Um, because you are taking this temporary earthly comfort and you are exchanging it for this long-term eternal divine joy. So all of these things are essentially distractions from God's love, which is really the only like true, unfailing, unmovable source of joy. Um, then she goes on to talk about like, you know, passions keeps coming up in this chapter, right? So she describes like gluttony as a passion and, and anger as a passion, like an earthly passion. And so she says, even like when we're in college or even after you graduate college, people are like, find your passion or um, and she talks about how this oftentimes gives people the wrong idea about what the goal of their life's work should be. So you, you know, I think we've all heard that saying that like, if you love what you do or you're passionate about what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. But that's patently untrue because the reality is that that way of thinking makes us impatient um, and it drives us away from the hard work and practice that leads to mastery, which eventually is the thing that is, it's kind of the other way around. Like if you master the thing, then you can be passionate about it because it gives you autonomy and it gives you, it's like these skills, but you're not passionate about something and therefore it should be easy. And she even says like people specifically in like creative industries, like writing or and this like really felt applicable to me because it's like oh I love this thing I should be able to do it all the time it should be easy but that's not true if you care about something you should nurture it and you should work hard on it um and she even mentions the woman who wrote a book called eat pray love which even like secular people in my life love this book and think it's you know a a very like great book about like following your passions or finding your passion but even um even inside of this book the lady who wrote this book she went on record saying like curiosity is so much better than passion because the world really like fetishizes passion and like becomes obsessed with it and thinks it's like the source of all of our happiness when in reality passion is fleeting like it doesn't last it doesn't it's not the thing that like stays with you right so she's like your curiosity is good because it will continue to drive that need inside of you to like learn and to be um you know to seek out what you need to know to to become better at whatever you want to do but passion is kind of she calls it boring. if i can say something in the beginning when she um talks about passion mm -hmm. and she said, not that how, like when we understand it in a positive way, as like you're describing now, and how it can be 
different. She describes it as like an imbalanced thoughts mm. like we, that leads to sin. Like she gives the example of like we have um, instincts and we have uh, things in us that are God uh, created like hunger, like um, uh, sexual tendency, things like that. She said like the, the passion is when this is not controlled and imbalanced, so the hunger becomes gluttony. So there is no control. Mm -hmm. And the sexual uh, desire toward your, your, your spouse becomes like a lust. So and eventually these, um, like if these uncontrolled passions can become addictions. So, and, and that's what the fathers, when they talk about, especially someone called Evagrius, so Evagrius has those uh, has that a uh, book. I don't remember. I think it's called the Eight Passions. So he puts them together. That here are the the most things that can move us. And here the author is saying that these passions, and he talked uh, talk about them thoroughly. That with every passion, the joy is taken away because this is not what is supposed to be. We, we take it to um, 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 like a different route. The other thing, uh, the apathia that she mentioned is that when this is controlled, not just controlled, it's when it's, I, we can call it, I think in the other book that we're reading, it's more uh, holy, like it's a uh, sanctified passion. It, it, now you're not moved by it like you're not like wherever it comes so inside us with the more struggle that we control all that like let's say jealousy like or something I, like we tend to compare ourselves and there's something good like i want to be better is part of our repentance um cycle and i want to be better uh in my life but when it takes that other route it becomes a, a, like a bad passion. So and the apathy is that like there is no that fight in me, like between the, the good side of it and the bad side, like I'm not moved, but that bad side of it, I guess that what she's, uh, she, um, so there is a harmony. She's saying yeah. also like, harmony of these passions. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Go ahead. So is the goal, of, sorry, this is actually a question based on what you just said. So is the goal then like, we understand that like hung, hunger can turn to gluttony. How do you know where the line is between like hunger and then maybe like even enjoying food versus like being gluttonous? So or with any of our basic instincts, like it's okay to be angry. Like, is it okay to be angry sometimes? You know, I, I don't know what the line is. Like but most of them, we have these two sides. Mm -hmm. or, uh, there was a book like I read, I'm not sure, um, but like one of them that doesn't have the other side is uh, slackness, like laziness <laughs> that has nothing good in this. But most of them has this book like hatred, like I hate, hate sin. And hate. So we should redirect them. But the, to your point is that if I am led by the Holy Spirit, I will definitely know if I am after something um, um, personal, like um, I want to fulfill, like even take on a good thing. Like sometimes uh, I would hear, and any one of us would hear, uh, like, and, and this is good. Like I would go to the liturgy to feel the peace. And this is good. But this is another goal of prayer and liturgy. So now the focus is me. It goes out of worship to a point that it becomes an addiction. When I'm having a problem, I want to go to the liturgy. This is not how it is. So I'm talking about, I'm putting it with, with a, like in the same style, how to discern. It's not a passion, but how to discern. So the focus is me. And the first thing, if I follow Christ, is not me. It's him. It's all about him. And I am in him. So when it's more of I go like uh, for my pride. Um, okay, so one of the things that I thought about, and I don't think she mentioned it this way, like let's say the anger that you just mentioned. Like it's good, and this is in us, to refuse falsehood. 
to refuse what's not truth. But when it turns to be anger, I'm not doing what, what it should be. Like I'm doing it sometimes because someone said something wrong about me. Or just for the concept, don't say something wrong in front of me. But this is not what it is because we can let things go since uh, I have no control or I have no say in it. So it becomes I'm the focus in this. And this is what discern. Am I doing this because of me or uh, because of the Lord? And it, you can take it on different levels. I think. Great. Thank you. Um, and going with these comforts and not letting them steal our joy. Um, she says that the difference between spirituality and these comforts is that spirituality is not a quick fix, right? So like there's no instant gratification involved and it requires all of our perseverance and our patience. Um, and she says like in the coming chapters of the book over the next few weeks, like specific practices that we use throughout our life to guide us towards joy um, and lead us away from indulging in these like creature comforts or worldly passions as she calls them. Um, then the author, do, would you like to add anything else about these passions before we go on to, she talks next about stressors. Yeah, number one is passions that thieves and then she puts, yes, the stressors. Go ahead, please. Great. Okay, so um, she goes on to acknowledge that passions are not the only thing that like steal our joy. There are a lot of like external stressors and conflicts and terrible things that are constantly happening, but it's us to us whether or not we let these things become so prevalent in our lives that they steal our joy. And she actually uses like a, a personal um, anecdote from her life, which is probably still very relevant for a lot of people. She talks about how she was like always a political junkie and became obsessed with the idea of like going to war in 2003 and she would like sign petitions and she would pray about it and she listened to NPR obsessively and it was like her alarm clock in the morning and eventually she found that like her um her passion about this 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 thing this war or the political climate that she was living in infiltrated her life so much so that she was like dreaming of like being in like, you know, the bombs going off, basically. And eventually she stopped listening to NPR as her alarm clock. Um, and she's like, 15 years later, I did all of that worrying and all of that panicking. And the end result was that the war happened whether I liked it or not. And so it didn't change the outcome of anything. It literally was just there to steal her joy. And so she says that this kind of passion is like, vainglory or pride that forced her to become obsessed with this thing and to go on to wonder like why isn't God answering my prayer when the reality is that his way is not our way and his thoughts are not our thoughts so when we put that kind of pressure on ourselves to you know be anxious about something we have no control over we we are letting ourselves we're turning ourselves over to one of these like passions that we are trying to avoid um, and so in order to receive God's pure joy, we also have to turn our control over to God, even in stressful external situations. Um, she also says that there is, uh, we all know that there's all this terrible stuff in the world, um, but the goal is that you don't let these things inside to steal your joy, right? Like this joy is inside of you. But if you leave the door unlocked, then the thieves get in. But if you if you keep it inside of you and secure it, um, and again, she the book will go over these practices over the next few weeks, but um, metaphorically, we want to lock these doors to protect our joy. Um, and I really liked this quote from um, Desmond Tutu. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, he says joy is a state, or he talks about how it's a state that is independent of circumstances. So he says, discovering more joy does not, I'm sorry to say, save us from the inevitability of hardship and heartbreak. In fact, we may cry more easily, but we will laugh more easily too. Perhaps we are just more alive. Yet as we discover more joy, we can face suffering in a way that ennobles rather than embitters. We have hardship without becoming hard, and we have heartbreak without being heartbroken. Um, and it's the same thing, the same joy that drives St. Paul, even though he's in chains, to tell his congregation, 
rejoice in the Lord always in Philippians, right? And it's the same joy that the martyrs have when they're marching to their death, right? To be beheaded and they're going with thanksgiving and they're glorifying God because our joy is in God. Um, and even when their, their loved ones receive the news who are left behind, who aren't going to Christ, right? A lot, many of them rejoice that they chose the path of salvation, even while they feel the pang of loss. Um, and the last story in this chapter of this book is very similar to this. Um, the author talks about her husband, who is a priest, going to a church in Sudan where terrorists give a young boy a ball to play with. And before he enters the church, um, inside they give him a ball to play with. I already said that. Um, and inside, he, uh, as soon as he bounces it with his friends, it detonates and it kills the boy. And so the church's priest goes to tell the boy's mother. And immediately the book says she uleates or uleates. And I was like, is this Zagrata? And so I had my mom look it up and it's Zagrata. So yeah. she, she literally started to Zagrat. Uh, um, and she was rejoicing. And she said, my son died in the church. He is a martyr. I am not worried about my son. He is in heaven now. And she even goes so far as to say, like, I'm to the priest, like, I'm worried about you. Did you get hurt? Um, and so this woman had her joy and no one could take it away from her because her joy was in the resurrection of the Lord, which conquers all evil, even death, no matter how tragic and no matter how heartbreaking broken or no matter how heartbreaking something is, we are not actually broken. And this reminded me in second Corinthians, this is one of my favorite passages uh, chapter four, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body of dying, uh, about in our body, the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Um, and there's also one more quote at the end of the chapter, or not quote, it's a Bible verse. Um, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Um, so, Abuna, that's all I have. So please. Thank you. No, very good. Thank you. That's all of this. It's a, it's a good chapter. I think it's still a, a prep chapter to the, the practices. Um, and yeah, it's, she sums them and two things, the passions and the stressors, I guess, like put them more, the passion that's what's inside us, um, obviously, um, triggered, as you said, um, by being less attentive to what's outside, letting it inside. And also the stressors, which I thought it just outside, but there is a stressor like this conflict in us like not just the like the wars and uh, the, the 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 killing of people and things like that but they are still um the same thing um so yeah god willing next time we will uh, continue um we'll take the um, chapters next time any questions anyone has marcelino you have a question Okay, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, only God, amen. God, make us worthy of pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, for then is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever, amen. The love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Fellowship, communion, and gift of the Holy Spirit be with all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Have a good night, guys. Thanks, Abuna. Bye, Marcelino.